please can you remind me if you'll if you'll be so kind staring out into space asking god to hear my case trying to think of all things past how long will my memory last with purple angels Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. This is your host and founder of Alzheimer's Speaks, Lori LeBay. Um, For those of you that are new to our show, I'll just give you a little introduction to who we are and what we're about. Basically, Alzheimer's Speaks is an advocacy-based company providing multiple platforms to shift our dementia care culture from crisis to comfort worldwide. We believe that by joining forces and sharing knowledge and just having these everyday conversations about life with dementia, that we're going to be able to remove the stigmas and empower people to live well with the disease, both those diagnosed and their family and loved ones uh, caring for them. Together, we know we can help everyone understand what the true needs are and what the emotional cycles are that people go through with this disease, along with the physical and mental cycles of dementia. At our core, Alzheimer's Speaks collaboratively, we're going to be able to win this battle against dementia. And we know it's working because of all of your likes and clicks and shares on social media. Each one of you has had a huge impact on raising awareness for Alzheimer's and dementia and caregiving by sharing the information that Alzheimer's Speaks uh, provides you. Um, because, <clears throat> and the reason I say that is we were, we were named the number one influencer online according to Share Care and Dr. Oz, and that would not have happened without you guys taking those few seconds to just click and share. So I would encourage you to do that with um, each and every show that we do, along with our blog, uh, the Dementia Chats webinars, which we just did uh, earlier today, which is a a free webinar as well. Uh, We do those twice a month. Uh, Today on that uh, program, we talked about the holidays and the effects on those with dementia. We talked about the need for organizations to collaborate, and we talked about What happens when illness hits, and how does that kind of throw a person with dementia and their routine off kilter? So I'll be posting that a little bit later uh, this evening or early tomorrow for everyone to be able to watch. Um, Again, I just, I really appreciate all the support from everybody regarding Alzheimer's and dementia. As you're listening, you might think, gosh, you know what, maybe I could be a guest or I have something to say. We would love to hear from you. And so you can use our chat box to go ahead and communicate with us. And we'll be monitoring that throughout the show. Um, Or if you think you might be a guest, maybe you're an author, maybe you've written a poem or a story. Uh, Maybe you've developed a new business or service. Um, or you just have a question that you feel needs to be talked about, uh, reach out to me at lori at alzheimerspeaks.com, and I would be glad to have that discussion. We talk to people on all levels uh, throughout the world because we just think it's important to be inclusive. Now here um, at the Alive and Social studio, I just want to give a shout out before we begin to a couple of my cohorts here. Um, The first is Apples to Apples. And if you haven't watched uh, or listened to that show, I should say, um, Apples to Apples is really a fun based show because it's a father and son that does a lot of bantering. Um, Scott and Drew Applebaum. And they talk about sports and he'll kind of figure out if a father really knows best on, on what's going on. The shows are typically Monday at 2.30, so check check them out. The other one you might be interested in is Mortgage and BS. Um, there you're going to find out um, <clears throat> from local mortgage expert Tom Smith and radio personality um, BT will discuss um, mortgages on the whole and then kind of just what's going on. Um, what what can you leverage and um, use to the best of your your ability to live well? And their show is on Thursdays at four o'clock. So you might wanna you might wanna check them out. Let me go ahead and introduce our guest here today. I'm I'm very excited to have Christine Grout 
um, with us. She earned her chemical engineering degree back in 79 and worked on product development for several years before she became a full-time homemaker raising three sons and a daughter. But in 99, Christine returned to school and she earned her bachelor's degree in English with a minor in written communications. And she is now the author of um, two books, Dancing in Heaven, A Sister's Memoir, and the Mem- and Where Memories Meet, Reclaiming My Father After Alzheimer's. And um, the second book um, that I just mentioned, Where Memories Meet, is what we're really going to talk about today. So welcome to the show, Christine. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me as your guest, Lori. And also, I wanted to thank you for everything you do to help raise awareness about Alzheimer's and give people hope. I I think it's great what you're doing. Oh, thank you. It's that's always nice to hear, you know, but it it takes all of us. It takes not just a village, it takes a world, you know, to to raise the awareness that's needed. And (laughs) so um, we really have to kind of put those hands out and lift one another up and, uh, you know, just assist one another through this, through this process, through this maze of a disease that is, um, you know, is very little known about it. And um, so that's what I love when people share their own personal stories. Can you tell us where memories meet? Um, You've written it a little bit different because it has two narrators, both you and your father. Can you tell us why you took that approach? Well, um, I wanted the book to focus on the man, uh, not the disease. And... um, my father actually wanted me to tell his story. This was before he ever got Alzheimer's and that we knew he had Alzheimer's. So I had started interviewing him before we, we even knew that he had a problem. But And I think he wanted to tell his story because I think he wanted to share his sort of, I started out as a disadvantaged person uh, in terms of family life, and um, I could write about it. So I think he had an interest in sort of inspiring people with that. Um, and then I wanted to when you started getting Alzheimer's, I journaled a lot throughout that. And I just thought I needed to combine the two stories. So I tell my father's story going forward of his life, but I tell my story of my experience with his uh, dementia going backwards. Um, And I think I did that for a couple reasons. The primary one was I wanted the story to end at a good place. If you tell the Alzheimer's story from the beginning to the end, we, we know how that ends. Um, I wanted to walk myself backwards through my father's life, through this experience we had, and get to a place where I could, it was a good place to be before he got it. Also, I think that the end of the Alzheimer's, I mean, the beginning of the Alzheimer's story is actually more mysterious, perhaps you might want to say, or intriguing than the end, because you're taking a perfectly normal person and all of a sudden strange things start happening. And I think that's more interesting and a little bit more intriguing. It's not a suddenly like a heart attack. All of a sudden, you know, you've had a heart attack. It's a kind of a gradual dawning on you that something is happening. Um, so that's, that's primarily the, uh, the reason I wanted to tell my story backwards and his going forwards. I wanted our mem- I wanted to meet where the memories were good. Well, and that's a, that's a lovely approach. And, um, I think something that a lot of people wouldn't have even thought of um, in terms of, of looking through, you know, looking through the, the glass and and um, saying, you know, what makes sense here and, and um, how it is perceived different from, from the two sides there. Can you tell us um, what, what made you decide to write the book? I always find that really interesting. And how did you come up with the, the title? Well, you know, I knew somebody whose mother had Alzheimer's maybe 10 or 15 years ago before my father got it. And I would always ask her, does your mother still know who you are? That was the thing that I knew about Alzheimer's. And that was pretty much the only thing that I knew about Alzheimer's. And once I got inside of it with a family member, I realized, wow, there's a lot more to this than just not remembering who people are. And it's sort of a continuum of things that go that go wrong. And, and I lived it with him, you know, knowing him as my father. And uh, I didn't live with them. I didn't, I wasn't his primary caregiver. My mother was his primary caregiver, but I would say I was like on the B team, you know, I was the next level of support. And I, and I went up and saw them 
at least weekly. And I tried to use that time working with my father or doing something to help my mother in the care of my father. So I think that um, I've lost my, <laughs> lost my train of thought where I was going with this. I, what, what did you ask? Well, I, I was, I was just asking, um, you know, why did you decide to write the book and, and, yes. and how well, did you and I, the title? And I thought knowing that, knowing how little I knew before and then seeing how much I learned, I thought there are probably other people like me out there who could benefit from understanding what so many people go through or at least something similar to what so many people, a lot of people have Alzheimer's. And I don't think we all understand the full implication of that. And I had the experience and I write. So that was my way of sharing it. Okay, great. And how did you, how did you pick the title? Well, like I said earlier, my one uh, day I was talking to my dad about his own story. He got to a place where, in the story where I was an adult and I was old enough to read, he said to me, well, you know the rest of the story. And I thought, and it made me realize that our memories do meet in places. My father's life story until that point was his memories that I didn't have. And my memories from his Alzheimer's and to some point back in time were my memories that he probably didn't have. But somewhere our memories met. And there's a time period where our memories met. And that's the time period that I wanted to get back to. Okay. Now, um, can you, I, I would imagine before you wrote the book, you probably checked out a lot of the other um, books on Alzheimer's and dementia um, and, and did some research on it. What, what do you think makes your book different? Well, I, I, um, I can't be completely sure about this because there are a lot of books out there, but I think the fact that I tell it from the beginning, from the end to the beginning makes a difference. I think most people probably go chronological. And I did that partly because I wanted to um, take the focus of the book from the disease itself and place the emphasis on the man. I wanted the reader at the end to, to remember the man because I do think it, I do think it's something that captures our um, and te- uh, tension and intrigue. It's, when something goes wrong with the brain, I think it's it's interesting. People wonder about that and are curious about that. And, and but I wanted the book to be more than just about what was going wrong with his brain. I wanted the book to be about. I wanted to raise up the man that this was actually happening to. And um, I think other people have done that too. But I was just trying to really focus on the man behind the disease. Okay. And, and that makes sense, uh, especially um, from a daughter's view. I mean, I look at, at my mom and I always wanted people to you know, see the person, you know, not, right. not the disease. And I think that's one of the, the beauties and one of the huge lessons um, that this disease teaches us is that just because somebody looks the same doesn't mean that they are the same. And, um, but yet, yet the core of their soul, you know, hasn't changed. Um, right. They're still, the, they're still who you loved and cared for. And, and maybe they're kind of gone or a little to sleep or, or something. But you're not only who's inside of you, you're also what other people think of you and see of you. And I, I just, I agree. I think when you have somebody who goes through that, it, it, it changes how you, you view it. And I'm afraid some people... We don't know the, the person beforehand, you know, might not realize mm-hmm. what a person they really are. Exactly. Do you want to maybe share um, an excerpt um, of your book and we can talk about that a little bit? Sure. I have something here. Um, it's just a short excerpt. I can locate it quickly. It was, I wrote this in August of 2012, which was just about, uh, less than half a year before uh, he died. But, and I had been talking to my mom on the phone and she was saying that my dad was not very responsive and she was having trouble giving him this medicine and um, people couldn't get him to uh, look at them, her, his health, home health days, and my mom couldn't get him to respond. And I wrote, I've been in a place of complacency recently, thinking everything is moving along okay. But I know dad could just check out at some point and we won't be able to get through to him or have a response from him. Right now, most of the time, we can still get a nod or a shake of his head in response to a yes or no question. 
Sometimes we can get a thumbs up or down. I think I'm doing okay with him fading away. But the fact that he's still here and can respond is huge. If that goes away, it really will be much harder. We have still more to lose. Yeah, and isn't it kind of a fascinating journey how much there is to lose in this process because you do have multiple losses with this disease. And I know for me, it really made me realize how much was there. I mean, in, in, exactly. because you kind of take it right. for granted. And, um, and, but you, when you keep having one loss after another, and it can just be little things from, you know, them not being able to maybe physically do something that they used to, to not remembering your name or not remembering a moment in time, um, to just the touch or the smile or, um, you know, the, the, the soft support that you just always relied on. Um, right. It's, it's, it's very big stuff and um, some beautiful, beautiful lessons to, to learn through, through the process in and of itself. Um, <clears throat> what have you learned as a person um, going through this disease with your family? Um, I think I think I'm still learning things, even though it's been three years since my father died. Um, I I think I I I think I'll read one more little excerpt here because I I think this says the process uh, kind of it kind of answers your question about one of the things I learned. I said. Um, <clears throat> I'm struggling with, let's see, when did I write this? I also read this about the same time I wrote the other one. I'm struggling with that situation more than usual. I think it started last month with a phone call on Father's Day. What did you say that made him cry? Mom, who had taken the phone from Dad, wanted to know. Hello, I answered. I told him hello. Or maybe it was a breakfast we picked up from Golden Nugget on the Saturday before Father's Day. And all the memories that flooded me as I waited in Dad's favorite breakfast restaurant where we had waited together so many times. The look on Dad's face as he struggled to walk continues to haunt me long after I've left him behind in Dayton, long after I try to relax at home in my study, listening to soothing music and watching the sun sparkle off the leaves fluttering on the trees just outside the window. I know that there is nothing I can do to help Dad out of his misery, out of this nightmare he's living. I have to make peace with his situation and with myself. It is the only way to go on. I feel like I am cutting a painful tooth, a kernel of wisdom about to erupt. And I realize that love is what matters. Love is all that matters. Wow. Um, <clears throat> how, did, how did you um, come to find that peacefulness that you, that you mentioned? Well, I don't know that I did. You know, I think the whole, the journey for me was up and down. You know, I would have, and, and in the book, I, it's interesting because I'll have a place in, where I'm at peace with it, and then I'll have another place where I'm, I'm not. And I, I just think when things were on a steady keel, I think I was able to get the sense of, of we're okay, we're doing okay, and then something new would come up. Maybe he couldn't swallow as well, or, you know, something new would come up. And um, and that would always upset the apple cart. And uh, so I do think there were a lot of ups and downs with it when you're on an even keel. But the the disease is progressive, so you don't stay on an even keel. Mm -hmm. And you, you know you go you you go up and down with it. Yeah. Now, as far as family goes, how did your own family adjust to you? Um, you know, caring for your dad and going through this because I know sometimes it can take a toll on your own family. Um, yes. Well, I, I wasn't, um, my children are all grown. They're adults. They're on their own family. I do have my, my husband. He was extremely understanding and supportive. Mm -hmm. And he, so a lot of times would go up with me. We try to take dinners up sometimes and share those with my uh, parents to give my mom a break and, um, just to get, provide them some kind of company entertainment, um, and he and he and he participates in all that. He's he's extremely supportive. Well, that's wonderful. Um, yeah. Not not all spouses are at times. And, 
can imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, during the process and and even, you know, you had mentioned you weren't the primary. It's it still weighs on your heart and your mind though. Um, I think quite a bit or it does most people that I talk to. Sure. Sure. And, it's on there. It's like constantly being under this cloud or mm-hmm. in this fog. You're it, it's constant. I wouldn't go I would because I took the role of trying to entertain my father. I would go up there with some kind of activity for him to do. Or at first, before he got was really bad and could still go places, I'd take him places. You know, take him to the store, take him to a breakfast, and I just tried to give my mom a break that way and to give him some kind of enrichment in his life or entertainment. So um, that was the that was the role I I played, and. Um, <coughs> Again, I don't know where I was going. I went off on a tangent. I don't know what your question was. <laughs> that's okay. That's that's okay. Not a problem at all there. Um, when you when you wrote the book, did you have a, a particular audience in mind that you wanted um, that you thought would be drawn to it? Well, like I said before, I, I wanted to be able to let people who don't have haven't had experience to gain some experience or some knowledge or understanding of the disease. But I actually think there are three categories of people uh, that could possibly benefit from the book, and the first being the one I just mentioned. The second one being somebody who might be going through the experience just to know that they aren't the only one who went through something like this. I think sometimes that gives you strength and comfort. Mm -hmm. Although, truthfully, if somebody's really going through the experience, I'm not sure that they have a lot of time to read a lot of books, but uh, it's possible that they, they could. And then the third one, which most people don't think about, but when my father died, my last memories of him were what were foremost in my mind, and I didn't want to remember him that way. A lot of people have an experience of having lost somebody to something like Alzheimer's, where the person they end up losing doesn't really resemble the person they knew. I wanted my last memories. I wanted to get to a place where I had a healthy memory of my father. Um, that was the place where I looked back to in the memory. It's not that I want to completely forget everything that happened. It's just that I don't want that to be the thing that colored my memory of him forever. So I think sometimes someone who has, who has lost someone that may be kind of stuck in that place of not remember who they really were or being not being able to, you know, I was thinking that they could possibly benefit from this this mm-hmm. process of just kind of stepping back through time and getting back to that, that place. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, wonderful. I was um, reading, a, and this is at the very end of your book, um, under October 3rd, 2008, um, a piece that just kind of hit me. It says, I'm, I'm trying to think of ways to simplify Annie's care because your mom was having a difficult time because she wanted your dad to help with feeding. And um, you said, I, you know, I try to have a conversation with dad about his confusion. Mom has told me about an episode earlier this week when dad woke up in the middle of the night and was in a panic attack. It sounded like maybe he woke up in a dream and was really confused. It was a frightening experience for him. And, um, you know, you say, what do you, what do you think is going on to him? And dad says, the best I can describe it is, it feels like an old milk horse that just knows the route and continues along its path, even though the driver is now missing. And, um, and I just thought that that was just a really interesting observation on on his part um in terms of what what he is saying i um you know because on one side of me thought well that almost is a to me a calming place of just going in autopilot but yet there's this angst you know of this panic of not having the driver as well can you explain that um, a little bit more in terms of of your conversation with your dad on that well <clears throat> I didn't um I didn't really I didn't really have an extended conversation about that with him. My father was a very smart man and he understood people and he had a way of understanding the crux of a problem 
So for him to come out with that was, I think, I look back at it as one of the outstanding, the things that stands out in the book uh, for me, too, is that he <clears throat> was able to verbalize that concept. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I really think that if we haven't gone through that uh, loss of cognitive ability in a way that a person with dementia loses it, I, I think it's very difficult for us to understand what that feels like. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I'm not sure we can. Yeah, I I find it really interesting as well on our Dementia Chats webinar this afternoon. We talked a little bit about that where um, the people, my experts that have dementia, talk about how frustrating it is when they find others, so-called experts, trying to um, describe what their life is like, um, and yet no one has really asked them what their life is like in terms of getting the details and stuff. And so it's just, uh, I think it's one of those things where we have to, we have to talk more, we have to ask more questions and again, not be, not be so afraid of, of the disease as a whole. Um, right. It, mm-hmm. One thing I really regret about my father was that he lost his speech fairly early in the process. So we, I didn't have the opportunity to talk to him a lot about what he was thinking about what he was going through and, and, and that, and um, and I, I, I regret that, but there wasn't anything really to do about it. He, he lost his ability to speak. So, um, you know, I agree with you. I, I, I don't think, I don't think it's. I think it's one of those things like parenthood or something that you can read all you want to about it, but unless you're actually done it, you, you just don't. There's a lot of stuff you don't get mm-hmm. about it. Yeah, that's very, very true. Very, very true. Um, what um, do you think that this experience with your dad um, changed your mom as a person? Um, my mom is an unusual case because she had a lot of things happen at the same time. My sister that I wrote about in Dancing in Heaven was severely disabled, and my mother had cared for her for 51 years, full time, three meals a day. You know, she cared for her like a baby. And then Annie, that was in 2008, dad was diagnosed. And my sister Annie got sick and then ended up dying in 2009. So my mother was carrying the burden of this grief, of the loss of her daughter that she had cared for for all those years, as well as the knowledge that dad wasn't going to be there by her side. Uh, in terms of a help me because he, he was going to need her care now too. She basically was a caregiver uh, from the time she was 20 years old on. My mom was. So uh, she was a remarkable person. But I think the loss of Annie's with not really having the time to grieve because of taking care of my dad, it, it, she was completely overwhelmed. So I don't know how it might have been under a little more normal the circumstance. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she was overwhelmed. Yeah, and rightfully so. I don't know how anybody couldn't be, um, you know, carrying that that kind of load because it is important to be able to have time to process our feelings. And, you know, when you're caring for multiple people, um, usually that's the last thing we think about trying to do is take time for ourselves because others need us. Right. She is a real study in caregiving. I can tell you that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did she have support from from friends at all, or she she had a lot of friends and um, and she had us and her kids and um, yeah. So I mean, she had emotional support and she was able to talk about things, um, but she also was determined in not burdening anyone else and also in not giving up the care, you know, just taking the care of the person. Like, she would not leave my sister Annie to go take a break. She, The last year of my dad's life, I don't think she left the house Mm -hmm. um, because she was so embroiled in that she needed to be the person taking care. She wasn't thinking at all of herself. And I think that that can be self-defeating, for one thing. You need to have, that's one of my last um, comments I'd like to drive home is that you have to take care of yourself as a caregiver. I mean, you just absolutely have to. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to do sometimes because you don't feel like you can. Yep. Yeah, I, as a society, we don't really give ourselves permission um, to care for ourselves and uh, to take that downtime. And it's so critical 
um, to, you know, to our well-being. Um, you know, emotionally, physically, psychologically, the whole, the whole nine yards. And a lot of times we end up just, you know, picking up somebody else to care for because that's, that's who we are at our core. And, um, but yet we can't just keep giving away. We have to get filled back up. And I wish that that was something that was taught more or um, talked about more. So that people- I agree with you. I think it's really important, and I I see it happening. And my mom was a classic, classic case of it. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, I I think you're right. Our society doesn't support that. Mm-hmm. Um, based on on your own you know personal experience, is there any advice that you would give someone who is dealing with a loved one that has Alzheimer's or dementia? Well, like I just said, I think the most important thing you can do is continue to take care of yourself. You know, and it's not easy for everybody to to get the help they need. Mom was lucky that uh, she and dad had long-term health care, um, and they primarily had that, had gotten that because of my sister Annie. My dad knew that something happened to one of them, they'd need to have help. Um, so some, they were able to afford getting home health aids in, Although my mother was, you know, resistant to even doing that for a while because she thought she should be doing it herself. But so I, I say the number one thing is to take care of yourself. And I don't know, I know that's easier said than done for some people who may not have the home health care aids or the insurance or the ability. But there are support functions out there if you can find them. Um, and I, I think you have to take breaks and take care of yourself. The other thing is... Uh, and I think this is really, really important, is that to try to celebrate what your loved one can still do. Mm-hmm. Instead of seeing it as a loss, try to sell it, try to see the cup half full. Try to see what's still in the cup. You know, try to appreciate what they can still do while they can do it, because that will change down the road. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um <clears throat> With this, with your book here, um, do you go out and, and, you know, speak to groups and, and talk about your experience at all? Or I haven't yet. I've been thinking about it. Um, I have contacted the Alzheimer's Association. I, I haven't signed up to be a speaker for them um, yet. I'm still thinking about it. I'm more of a writer than a speaker, so mm-hmm. I'm just not really sure sure how much that I'll do. I may go to a classroom or two uh, with it um, if I'm invited, which I have been in the past with my other book. So, um, but um, I, I, I'm just not really sure what that path looks like right now. Okay. Okay. I just thought I'd throw it out there because a, a lot of uh, people who write books end up kind of getting into the, the speaking circuit as well. Yeah. Well, it seems like, you know, I've seen that and that, and I was thinking that that could happen. I, I, you know, I admire you that you have actually turned in that direction and gone for the, the speaking. Um, and I might, I just don't know yet. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, good. Is there another excerpt that you'd like to, to read at all to our audience or? Uh, I could do one that, uh, like I said, I was trying to entertain him, do take, take things up there to, um, entertain my father and one of the things I had heard was that it's good to make a scrapbook with someone who has dementia because then they can go back through it and maybe help them remember family and, and events and, and stuff. So I had started working on a scrapbook with my father and I'd gone up to visit him and I had brought a plastic bin of supplies, special scissors, letter stamps and an ink pad cutting stencils, hole punches in the shapes of a heart, a star, and a flower, glue sticks, and lots of colorful paper. So in the last six months or so, we have completed scrapbook pages of him as a child, his parents, his military career, his siblings, and his wedding to mom. Last week, I brought photos I had printed of my oldest sister. Dad and I sit at the table for nearly two hours and work on the scrapbook. He loves using scissors. Even when I don't get him something specific to cut out, he continues to use the scissors on scraps of paper scattered on the table. He is very busy and quite content. It is a peaceful afternoon. The day gets late and I have to go home. I clean everything up and pack it back in my bin. Thank you, Dad, for helping me with the scrapbook today. He grabs my hand and squeezes it. 
his eyes intent on mine as if he is trying to communicate something to me. You're welcome, Dad. My pleasure. Mm. How nice, you know, just to be able to engage in that simplicity. And, um, you know, I, I just remember those moments with my own mom and, you know, they're really something. Yeah, they are. And I, you know, I do, I do have some good memories of that. And he was good at giving hugs. So even though the, his left, I think he may have also had a stroke. Mm-hmm. So his left side was more weak than his right. But he, he stood right beside him in the wheelchair. He'd reach around and, and hug you. Mm-hmm. And that, that's, that was nice. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, I th- missing a hug was probably one of the biggest things as my mom's disease progressed, that I didn't even realize how much I missed it until I was asked that question in a support group that I just happened to go to to listen to someone else talk. I wasn't there to, you know, as a, as a person needing Alzheimer's support. And it was just like, oh, my gosh, my heart just melted. And I got all teary And it was just like, wow, I didn't even realize how much I missed that. But you know, Yeah, I think that we're going to be facing stuff throughout the rest of our life that we're going to be, oh, you know, just like that, you realize I, I, it's a traumatic thing. I think going through loss this way is a very traumatic thing. And uh, it's going to take a lot of time to to heal that. Yep. Yeah. So, well, and it's it, part of it, too, is I think um, capturing memories in a different fashion, ones that we didn't think were going to be important. You know, we kind of pictured our life a little bit different in what would be those memorable moments. And um, this disease really gets you looking at things very, very differently. And, That's true, yes. You know, in, in terms of what's important. Well, any any last comments that you have for our audience that you'd like to share? Um, no, I would just say if someone's listening because they're going through it, my heart goes out to you and stay strong and try to enjoy, try to enjoy your loved one. Well, you can. I think it's important to try to keep enjoying your loved one. And um, I tried to do that, and, I, and I'm glad I did. Wonderful. Well, I appreciate the time that you spent with us today, Christine. And um, people can go to your website. Do you want to give them that address? Uh, my website is christinemgrody.com. Okay. And Grody is G-R-O-T-E. T-E. That's yes. correct. And um, you're also on Facebook as Christine M. Grody. And, That's correct. Uh, and they can, I've got a link in there where they can go, you know, to buy your book as well. And you're also on Twitter, at, and your handle is at CMSmith57. That's correct. Okay. Well, again, keep up the great work, and thank you so much for, for sharing your book um, with us. I, I loved the way that you wrote it with the two narratives um, and kind of going in reverse of each other to meet in the middle, and and uh, it's a really interesting way to, to, to read and to write. Again, the book's title is Where Memories Meet, Reclaiming My Father After Alzheimer's with Christine M. Grody. Um, thank you so much again, Christine, for being thank with us Thank you, too, Lori. You have a good day. You, too. Um, mm-hmm. Bye. For, for those oh. Of, oh, that's okay. Um, for okay. those of you that may not have listened to our latest show, um, we had Dr. Sonia Mashan, who is a neuropsychologist. You might want to go back and, and listen to that one. Um, in upcoming shows, you are going to hear from the award-winning um, director of just a fabulous, fabulous film called Inside My Being. And we are also going to be having on um, another author by the name of Lisa Skinner, who has written a, a marvelous book as well. Uh, Dementia Chats, we just did this morning. Again, I'll be posting that either later tonight or tomorrow, so you can go watch that. But we talked about um, changes during the holidays um, with... Uh, know what to consider in terms of noise level, background noise, what that feels like to them, um, they described, and and also kind of visual noise when things are really busy and and what they've done to change that. Um, They talked about when they're ill, how that can um, change their routines, and um, a few little tips there, and then collaborations in general. 
There was one uh, blog post that I want to point out to you as well that was on the 6th, and it's called Late, uh, Late Life um, Making a Difference, and it um, features just some fabulous um, short films that Alina Health and Life Course and TPT put together. And this one is really about, you're going to learn about care guides, which is something that I didn't know anything about, which I found fascinating. Thrivers, which has to do more with um, cancer and being physically uh, fit and picking exercises. But I think that that's something that could be modified to dementia. And then there's also a portion on memory cafes as well. So, again, I just want to thank everybody. And uh, if you haven't liked us or shared us, I, I would really appreciate that you do that to just, again, help raise the awareness. Have a wonderful holiday season, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Dom. Hi, this is Suzanne Newman, host of the Answers for Elders podcast and radio show. We are the North Star that guides you through the complicated journey of senior care with trusted experts in money, law, living solutions, and more. So join us on this station, your favorite podcast channel, or just go to AnswersForElders.com. Meet the Way Showers who will help your journey go a lot easier.